make them, especially the children, and they would leave them on doorsteps, and you wouldn't even tell them who you were. You would just sort of anonymously leave these gifts. Let's see, then May is Labyrinth Month. I didn't know that until this month when Robin King called and said she'd like to do a labyrinth walk this Saturday. But the labyrinth is the, the spiral, the divine feminine that takes us to our inner self, where we open and receive from the divine presence. So what a beautiful symbol for May. And then we have what my mother always had. I decided to do this year here is a May altar. I grew up with May altars. Did anyone else have a May altar when they grew up? I know it sounds sort of Catholic, and it was Catholic, <laughs> because it was for Mother Mary, but it, well, here we're honoring the Divine Mother by whatever name you call that presence in all of us. And we always had, of course, a picture or a statue of Mary. And then we had all the spring flowers. On our farm, there was an abundance of apple blossoms because we had so many apple trees, and there's nothing more beautiful than apple blossoms, I don't think. And then we had lilacs, and those little lily of the valleys that used to pop up, how oh, tiny they were. They were all our May altar flowers. I have so many memories of that. So again, today we're honoring the Divine Mother all month. Don't worry, men will honor the Divine Father next month. All aspects of the Divine Mother, by whatever name you call that presence, whether you call it Mary, whether you call it Grace, whether you call it Isis, or the Crow Mother, or Kuan Yin, you know, she has thousand names. But it's the presence of love and peace and the Divine Feminine in all of us. And so to this month on the May altar, you can bring your own symbol of the Divine Mother. You can bring a picture of your own mother. I have a photograph of my mother back there. You can bring whatever it is to you to honor that presence. Flowers are nice. Not expensive flowers from a store, but wild flowers or whatever, whatever we find in our backyards. Anyway, because we're honoring the Divine Mother this month, I thought we'd have to start it off with the Mother of Unity, Myrtle Fillmore. Often I quote Charles Fillmore because he wrote so many books, but Myrtle Fillmore was probably the energy that began the unity movement. And it is because of her that we are here today. And as you were singing, I was thinking how life is so uh, instant here and instant there. You know, Myrtle's no longer with us. She was like a dream that happened so long ago. And yet her influence, you know, what that woman did, is still with us in this room today. If you haven't read one of her books, She's written three of them, or there are three that I recommend reading. One is Myrtle Fillmore, Mother of Unity, which is about her, or the story of Unity, which tells her story and Charles. Then she wrote, How Does That God Help You? Because she knew that whatever problem, whatever the problem, God was the answer. And then she wrote Healing Letters, which, you know, in Silent Unity, our 24-hour prayer line, how many of you have called Silent Unity? I double-dog dare you for prayer 24-7. It used to be just her, you know, praying for others. And then as it grew and grew, and she would write her own letters to everyone that called or came to her for prayer. She would write them a letter. And that tradition is still going on today on a much larger scale, of course. But this book were her personal letters to people that called for prayer, and they're absolutely beautiful. So the month of May would be a good time to go in our lending library and learn about Myrtle. She's why we're here today. And to understand her, you have to understand, well, what is being a mother? What is a mother? I mean, you used to be proud to say you were a mother. And this generation, if somebody calls you a mother, it could be a swear word. So it's a little, <laughs> a little different. But in unity, we again honor the divine, the feminine nature in all of us. For God created us in God's image, male and female, feminine, masculine. He created all of us. And the Bible doesn't say the word Mother God like we like to do here at Unity, but talks about the feminine side of God over and over again. An example in the Old Testament is from Isaiah, where the divine says, you are precious in my eyes and I love you. Does that not sound like a mother? Jesus had his feminine side. He looked over Jerusalem and said, how often have I longed to gather your children as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings? That was his feminine side, you know. We all have two natures, 
feminine, masculine, mother, father, head and heart, intellect and intuition, rational mind, and that feeling nature of the heart. And they work together to create a reality. And we need both parents to manifest divine ideas. In unity, we talk about divine ideas a lot. What is a divine idea? It's whole and perfect from divine mind, eternal, unchanging, and a divine idea has creative power, creative energies. Our ego's ideas have a certain amount of energy to make something out of that idea. But let me put it this way. God may give me the divine idea of a beautiful orb, a circle, and I may make a flat, slanted orb out of it, you know, a flat, slanted oval out of this beautiful divine idea that God has created. In other words, God's divine ideas are beauty and joy, but what we make of that in our own lives may be a little less than beautiful, a little less than joyful, but the divine idea is always whole and perfect, eternal and lasting. And people, someone again this, just this week asked me, how do I know if I'm getting an idea, if this is a divine idea wanting to express through me, or if it's my own ego? How do we know the difference? And that's a brilliant question. And there are a few clues to help you understand that. One is, is the idea for the good of all? Our ego wants ideas that are good for us, but maybe not necessarily for each other. Is it for the good of all? And does it fit my talents and abilities? I keep saying I want to be a jazz singer, but if you've heard me sing, you know that is not a divine idea for me in this lifetime. Do I have a passion, energy, and zeal to carry it out? God would never have me do something that I didn't have the passion and energy and zeal to carry out. And finally, is it in the flow? Does the synchronicity of the universe support it? When I received my call to ministry, you know, my first thought was, how the, <clears throat> is that going to happen? You know? But then the universe, suddenly doors were opening, and the universe literally carried me through on my pathway to ministry. So is it for the good of all? Does it fit who I am? Do I have the passion for it? And is the synchronicity, is the flow of the universe taking me there. Those are all ways you can tell if this is a divine idea or your ego's idea. Now Walt Disney making Disneyland was to me the perfect example. Do you not love Disneyland? Is there a place on earth more joyous than Disneyland? What a divine idea that was as a place to express joy. And Walt Disney being the great metaphysician that he was received that divine idea. It fit his talents did he not have the gift of imagination? It fit who he was. And even though everybody around him said, oh no, that's too big of a dream, you can't do that. He was able to manifest on earth as it is in heaven. Because it was a divine idea, the synchronicity of the universe supported that idea. What a great example. Now the creative process in our lives takes both the father-mother energy, the feminine and the masculine. Now, if you're scientific, you could say electromagnetics, that opposite energy, the tension of opposites that work together. And is it not true that often in relationships we're drawn to someone just the opposite? If you're a morning person, they're a night person. If you're an introvert, they're an extrovert. If you like it cooler in the house, they like it warmer. You know, isn't that the way it goes? If you want to go camping, they want to go to a resort. You know, that the energy of opposites. Yes, it can be tension, but it creates an energy, and out of that energy comes the divine creation of whatever you've come to create together. And <coughs> Charles and Myrtle were that mystical marriage <coughs> of opposite energies working together. Where to put my water? Here it is. Let me just take a moment. The energy of the head and the heart. You see, Myrtle just intuitively knew prayer worked. She intuitively knew all the metaphysical principles that we teach at Unity were true. But Charles was scientific. He was of the rational intellect mind. And whatever she intuitively knew, he wanted to prove. If prayer works, he wanted to prove it worked.
for everyone in the same way. And you can see that the two of them together were the force that created all this, which is why we're here today. Each one had the feminine, masculine energy. Myrtle was intelligent as well as intuitive. Charles was very intuitive as well as intelligent. But one of them led more with one than the other. Now Myrtle's story is what started the unity movement. I'm sure you've heard it, but let's honor it again today. She had tuberculosis. Back then that was a death sentence. Today it's not. And in her illness, when she was at her weakest, lowest point, she went to hear a metaphysician by the name of Dr. E.B. Weeks. And he looked out and he said to them all, and she felt he was speaking just to her, you are a child of God. You do not inherit sickness. And when he said that, ooh, those words just filled her, burned through her, and she knew it was true. The train of reasoning is this. God is our Father, so to speak, in the creative process. We inherit from our Father. God is good, so we can inherit only good. And any limitation or lack is that which we make of our own selves. That's not what God would make for us. That's not God's will for us. So Myrtle set out to demonstrate. She had faith in the power of prayer to heal her life. And every day she would sit on a chair to pray. And she had another chair beside her where she said Jesus was sitting with her. And she talked to every cell in her body, calling in the healing power of the divine, honoring her body, forgiving, asking her body to forgive her being grateful for her body. She talked to every cell in her body, and day by day, week by week, month by month, she got better and better and better until the tuberculosis was completely gone. Now Charles, being the scientist, watched this all and thought, well, this is interesting. If prayer works, it has to be scientific. It cannot go against the laws of science. And if it works for one person, it has to work for us all, no matter what race, color, creed, or religion, or philosophy you come from. So he set out with his own body. He had an injury from childhood where he had been in a skating accident. And he began to heal for his leg to heal, and it began to heal. He never had the total, complete, 100% healing, but if you didn't know him, you wouldn't know he had ever had a problem. Prayer is scientific. It's practical. That's why we were often called in the old days, unity was called positive, practical Christianity. Because prayer works. It's practical. It's not an idea in the sky. Now in unity, we seek to know and prove the eternal truth in all things. And that's why we like to read all kinds of books and study all kinds of things. Because we want to find the truth in everything. There is truth in all philosophies. And we take what is true and bless the rest. Now, um, Charles Fillmore wrote the book, The Atom Smashing Power of the Mind. And I think it's a great book, even if all you read is the title, Atom Smashing Power of the Mind. Just take that home with you. His theory was atoms have power, do they not? Do we not have an atomic bomb to prove that atoms have power? And if you think of how many atoms our body holds, and if you think of the power of the mind, the power of thought and word to affect every atom in our body, do you realize the power we have then to heal, to restore, to renew ourselves, or to change our life? Atom smashing power of the mind. That's what prayer is. Thoughts held in mind produce after their kind. Will you repeat that with me? Thoughts held in mind produce after their kind. The power of prayer. Now meanwhile, Charles and Myrtle started to pray with all their friends. They taught classes. They published a magazine called New Thought Magazine. And positive practical Christianity was born from that. Like-minded people just like today coming together to find the truth in all things. The truth of the power of the divine within us, the power of the mind to create, prayer works through our thoughts and words. We are children of God. We do not inherit sickness. 
Let's put that into an I affirmation. I'm a child of God. I do not inherit sickness together. I'm a child of God. I do not inherit sickness. And their meetings, their gatherings were fun and exciting. And people began to transform their lives. And pretty soon they wanted that to be their church. Charles and Lord Myrtle did not have any intention of starting another religion. Just what the world needs, right, is another religion. But they were, I won't say forced to, they were encouraged to. And in meditation one day when Charles was meditating, the word unity came. Unity, we're all one. We all worship the same God. And that was the beginning of the unity movement. Now, they followed Jesus leading. Know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Know the truth. That's why they sought to find the truth in all things. That we're children of God, we're whole and perfect. The daily word today, we are made in God's image. But it's like somebody giving you an oval, uh, a circle and you make an oval out of it. I'm made in God's image, and yet look what I've done with it, you know? <laughs> that's, how we, that's how we are here. Or sometimes we make God in our image judgmental and angry or whatever, instead of ourselves in God's image. We inherit only from the divine, the rest is of our own making. And we inherit divine ideas to solve any problem in our life. There is a divine idea on what we should do. And divine ideas have creative power. Our ego can make a mess out of it, but they, can, they have creative power. Now Myrtle brought that faith to the unity movement. Charles brought the intellect, how to run a business, but Myrtle brought healing faith to the unity movement. And at one time when they were starting, just like our board of directors, some days we sit there and say, how are we gonna have the money to do this? And when they said that to Myrtle, they said, you gotta pray that our money holds out. She said, uh-uh, we gotta pray that our faith holds out. If your faith is there, the money will be there. If your faith isn't there, forget it. And the, the unity movement began to grow and prosper. At the Unity Village, how many people have been to Unity Village near Kansas City? A few of you have. Is it not beautiful? Fountains and rose bushes. But there's a, a grove called the Myrtle Fillmore Grove. And when you go inside, the branches of the trees make an arc above you. And you feel like the Divine Mother, Myrtle especially, is, is holding you there. If she were here today... I think she would say to us, call silent unity for prayer. Sometimes we all need a little help. Call silent unity for prayer. Or take that spiral within. Now Charles Fillmore, he would have loved the fact that there's actually an app for it for your phones now. You can get a silent unity app for your Apple phone. And you can just hit it and you're, send a prayer to silent unity like that and they'll email you a prayer letter back. Now those letters that Myrtle used to write by hand are sent to you via the email. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> Charles would have loved that. Myrtle, I'm not so sure, but <laughs> Charles would have loved that. But she would ask that we pray that the desires of our heart, those divine ideas, be manifest. What divine idea is God desiring to manifest through you today? It can be something big or it can be something little. Maybe it's to be the presence of love a little more stronger. Maybe it's to forgive. Maybe it's to leave a May basket on someone's doorstep today. What divine idea is God desiring to manifest through you today? Your heart knows. Ask your heart. That's the divine feminine. The part that opens and receives and listens and receives from spirit. The masculine coming into the feminine. Manifesting on earth as it is in heaven, the realm of divine ideas. We are here today because of one woman, Myrtle Fillmore. That's why we're all here today. She started Silent Unity. She started the prayer ministry. One by one with her praying with others, and pretty soon it grew and grew and grew. And now it's a 24-hour prayer line with people calling from all over the world at any time of day or night. She started that with one idea of the prayer of faith, that I'm a child of God, that prayer has power, that prayer is scientific. One woman's faith, one woman's prayer practice, one woman's search for truth, and here we are today. Let us take that into prayer right now. 
a prayer of gratitude as we remember and bless Myrtle Fillmore. We bless the light that she is still shining. We bless her energy that is with us here today in this room. We have blessed her intention to extend her love to be the love that she was. <laughs> and that love is still being extended from person to person, from one idea to the next. We receive her blessings today. And we, in turn, are the love that extends to others now. As we say, thank you, Father, Mother, God. We accept this and we send it out in the name and the nature and the consciousness of the living Christ. And so it is. Amen.